I'm John Holler, the CEO, and on behalf of the trustees and our staff, our members, and our amazing volunteers, it's just a wonderful uh, thing to have you here tonight, and I'm delighted to welcome you on their behalf. This uh, series, Revolutionaries, our speaker series, was named, of course, in honor of the opening of Revolution, our big and bold new exhibition downstairs. If you haven't seen it, I hope you have a chance to see it, a $20 million exhibition of the history of computing everything from the abacus to the iPhone. And Revolutionaries, the speaker series, is made possible by a couple of good friends of the museum. The first is the Intel Corporation, which has provided the major funding for this series, and also the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. So we're very happy to have both of them as partners in this. Within the Revolutionary series, we're starting tonight a subtract that we call Game Changers. Game Changers is both literal, and that these are things that really have changed the game for computing and for society, and it's also a play on words because it will focus on gaming. And many of them will be moderated by the man who's going to be moderating tonight, our friend Rich Hilleman. The Twitter hashtag for tonight is CHM Game Changers. So if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag. One of the great joys of doing things like uh, being at the Computer History Museum is to explore the fun side of computing and the fun side of technology and what could be more fun than gaming. And tonight with this program, we have two of the very best people you could possibly hope to hear from to talk about the world of gaming. Let me talk a little bit about the moderator. Richard Hilleman, who is going to be here tonight and we hope in the future to discuss future game changers. Rich is a very, very good friend of the museum. He has been a participant in our Talking to the Future and Get Invested programs for education with high schoolers from San Jose, from Monterey, Mexico. Uh, he has been interviewed by our curator, Chris Garcia, and he has been a panelist here for uh, more than one conference. And we're just delighted to have Rich be affiliated with the museum in this way. Rich has played just about every role you could possibly play at one of the best known gaming companies in the world, Electronic Arts. He soldered cables, uh, he's burned discs, and of course he is one of the most accomplished game designers in the business. Chuck Yeager's Flight Simulator, the first NFL football game featuring John Madden, of course, the first NHL game, and the last game that he worked on before moving on to uh, even more important duties at EA was Tiger Woods Golf. He's been a general manager at many levels at EA. Uh, for 12 years he's been a teacher and that's the role we've seen him play most effectively here and he's a magnificent teacher of uh, people of all ages. And in 2008 uh, he assumed the uh, rather large role formerly occupied by Bing Gordon as the chief creative director of Electronic Arts, a very big job for a very creative company. Rich is going to give Mark Cerny, our guest of honor tonight, a proper gamer's introduction. Just let me note that Mark is a true revolutionary. He may be one of those people you may not be uh, completely familiar with because uh, in the gaming industry he is legendary, but for people who don't know the gaming industry, it's going to be a fun introduction to him tonight. He is, uh, he's received so many awards throughout the industry, almost every award you can think of, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Game Design Association, and he was named in 2010 as the 13th member of the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. We are delighted to have Mark here to be questioned by our moderator, Rich Hillman. Please welcome them both, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks. Uh, I'll do my best uh, gamer's introduction here. Usually what happens in the game business is you talk about what people have worked on. So I have a small list on here, and it's by no means final, but it's a nice start. So here's a small list of his credits. Um, Marble Madness, California Games, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, Major Havoc, one I didn't know before today, Spyro, Crash, Total Eclipse, Sonic 2, and many other games like Uncharted that he's contributed since then. In addition to the obvious things that Mark does today for Sony, he's been an engineer, an artist, a theoretician, a hardware architect and designer, a manager, a game designer, an executive, and most recently, to his surprise, a writer. Um, he has won multiple industry awards, including the IDGA Lifetime Achievement Award and the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Award. So that's how Mark comes to our space. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Mark for off and on for roughly 20 years on various things, sometimes on the same side of the ledger, sometimes helping each other in surreptitious ways. But uh, we enjoy ourselves a great deal. So. Uh, 
help me participate in this process. Please help me write some other questions that we can ask Mark later on, but I'll get us started. So well, actually, uh, before we get going, sure. uh, we have a couple celebrities tonight That's I wanted true. to give a shout out to. We have Al Alcorn, the uh, creator of Pong. We have uh, Steve Russell, Steve Russell, the creator of Space War, who I've never had the pleasure of meeting, but it's nice to see you there. Uh, we have a hardware engineer who contributed a bit to Breakout, which is an early arcade classic, and he did pretty well later on, he, didn't he? Did he? Okay. I'm talking about Steve Wozniak. Yeah, they, uh, sometimes the game business helps other parts of the business. Yes. <laughs> Well, so those are the guys we're going to get our pictures taken with later, because that we think are. So uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things here, but I think that for those of you who aren't in the game business, we want to talk about things that are interesting to you. So we're, we're going to start with some pretty basic stuff. So Mark, what, what do you think are the reasons why people find games so fascinating? Oh, we, do, we have to start with the deep stuff. Let's start with something easier. All right. We'll get back to that. Oh, we're not doing that one first. All right. So uh, what do you do for Sony, Mark? Oh, what do I do for Sony? Uh, it's, it's hard even to explain to my father at times. Um, <laughs> I, Sony has a lot of little groups that do technology in various places. And so I do what I call international glo what is it? global technology coordination, which is a fancy way of making sure that the left hand talks to the right hand. And why that needs a trained professional, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, at this time, I'm, I've got a game project I'm working on, which is not announced yet. And very, it's, it's really not, unfortunately, it's a lot like film. In film, everybody knows what you're doing, and they know what stars are going to be in it, and uh, they know when it's going to release, uh, they know the title. And in games, you know, until the moment when you walk out on stage and announce what you're doing to 5,000 people, that thing is top secret. We, we even make stuff up that isn't true about it sometimes. If we're smart. <laughs> I think one of the things that makes me excited about this is it's been a few years since Mark actually got to be as actively involved in directing a game to, to be finished. And so I'm looking forward to the results because it's, uh, I learn something every single time. Um, so in your current job, you do a number of different things. What do you think an ideal day would look like, knowing that they never happen? An ideal day. Uh... I don't know. I mean, for me, the, the, the interesting thing is about not going in to do the same thing every day or not working even with the same set of people every day. I mean, it's inevitable that whatever group you're working with, uh, you, you, know, you get a little tired of that. And so if you're working on a couple projects at once, um, then you know, maybe you're tired of programming for Project X that week, and then you can do, do, go do a bit of game design for Project Y. For, for most of the last 20 years, um, I mean, typically, I've been working on anything from two to four games at once and in roles that are somewhere two down or ten down in the hierarchy. Um, right now, it's amazing to be uh, so heavily involved in a game yeah, that's, that I haven't done in, in 20 years. Wow, I didn't think it had been yeah. quite that long. Um, one, of, one of the things that I have always been impressed by you is your ability to maintain your grasp of the absolute cutting edge of hardware technology in a business that increasingly doesn't spend a lot of time paying attention to that. How do you keep up on that so much? Well, I don't know. I mean, the bits and bytes are pretty easy in the end. I mean, I don't really... The, the trickier part of the equation is the human equation. I mean, ultimately, there's going to be uh, the, the human factor. Ultimately, there's going to be a player. They're going to play that game. What are their expectations? And that changes uh, every couple of years. There's some kind of... Um, revolution in people's expectations about what a, playing a game is going to bring to them. So right now we're in the middle of the tablet gaming revolution and are we still doing the phone game revolution or is that over? We had the Facebook revolution. That depends on how big the phone is. And you know, compared to that, the hardware just doesn't change that much. Um, oh, we're going to come back to that one too, but uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, we, we have a business that um, attracts a, a high degree of people who have unique and, and uh, unique combination of skills. And sometimes it, we come to our business because we're looking for things, and sometimes we come to our business because we're running away from things. What are the things that make Mark Cerny afraid? <clears throat> wow, can we come back to that one too? No. Uh, <laughs> Should we let him come back? 
I mean, for me, um, I find the actual process of doing low-level game design unbelievably stressful because you're creating a scenario in your head for the, the hour of the game and you're, you're trying, there's so many things you have to think about. You, you have a, a level in this game, you have an objective, so you want to be sure that you can see the objective from the start of the level. You want to be sure that as you move through the terrain you don't get especially lost, but there's still an aspect of exploration to it. You want to make sure that it never gets monotonous. You want to make sure, by having various styles of design within it, you want to make sure that nothing repeats too much because people will think they've gone back. You want to mix up the scenarios that they face in terms of the combat or whatever mechanic that you're facing. You want it to be artistic on some level. You're flat out guaranteed that all of those objectives cannot be achieved at once. And so the process of creating a design is staring at a piece of paper in the old days, in the new days it's working in Illustrator and staring at your screen, getting very little done. Um, it, it frankly is not very much fun to do, but the fun is, that's just the start of it. The fun is when it's all built six months later and you go, go back and do it, it usually turns out okay. But there, there, is, you, a lot, you, there is a lot of uh, fear and unknowns in that process. Uh, it, it, one of the things that I've always thought was remarkable about your products is that you are clearly having almost a conversation with your customers, with, with your players, about what you're trying to teach them about when you're going to figure out how to use what you've taught them to matter to them deeply in the game and how that yields some, some deeper meaning to that user. And that seems to be a big part of the process for you. Yeah, I mean, it, to the degree you can make it intentional, it's great. I remember, uh, I think it was Gwyn uh, Gwyneth Paltrow once in an interview saying that, yes, she'd chosen this particular moment in the movie as to be the moment when she was going to smile for the first time <laughs> and to intellectualize it to that degree. I guess you have to because that movie is filmed out of order, right? Yeah, so if you haven't planned it all out in advance, it won't be happening on the screen. Um, but. Yeah, we have our own version of that. I mean, everything that the player is going to do in the game needs to be introduced and, in fact, reintroduced. Yep. If we're clever about it, we're even watching the player's behavior, figuring out what they understand and don't understand, and then re-cueing them as nicely as possible. We don't want to say, oh, you're, you know, you're bad. We just want to say, by the way, have you forgotten? Uh, hold this button to do this kind of action. And players aren't all the same. One of the advantages that Hollywood have, has is they really kind of have your attention and you don't, they don't give you any buttons in the theater to deviate from any of the controls. So we have to anticipate all that change. Um, so I, I have seen you over the years grow in a lot of ways and, and uh, I've watched you actually vanquish some of those fears. So Mark is one of the more uh, innovative people in our space and thinking theoretically about how our business should work. And, and several years ago, we're going to talk about it a little later, he helped create something called the Cerny Method which is a guidepost for many of the designers in this business about the questions they need to ask about their games. But the process of telling the rest of the world about that at the time was hard for Mark. That, that, was, that was difficult. Yeah, that was my first, um, first time to speak in public. And uh, you know, I've heard about, um, is it a hot sweat or a cold sweat where you wake up in the middle of the night where you, you're burning, you think you're going to die. Um, <laughs> And a couple nights before the speech, I, I actually did do that. Um, I mean, it was the point where I had to write down every word that I was going to say or I wasn't confident that I could be at all coherent on stage. One thing I did learn is there's, there's slow time and there's fast time. And slow time is everything that happens up until the point when you get up on stage. And then it's fast time. It's a white blur. You speak, <laughs> and then an hour later, it's over. And it doesn't feel like an hour, does yeah, it? Yeah, it doesn't, no. <laughs> well, I, I watched Mark, who basically op operated on basically pure terror for about an hour and a half or so during that one, including questions that he soldiered through. The questions were the most amazing part. Um, so the, in the last year, Ed Logg, who's one of our mutual friends from the old coin-op days, um, got a Hall of Fame award this year from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. And I sat with three of our friends who had watched Mark 10 years before or so go try and go through this process, and we couldn't believe who we saw. Us. Oh, it gets easier. I mean, the main reason I didn't start speaking until then was I didn't particularly have anything to say. I, I had been making games for 20 years before I thought I had anything that 
the rest of the industry would be interested in hearing. That was probably too long. Maybe. Maybe. I think your um, microphone's falling down. Oh, no, my microphone's falling down. I'll fix it. So uh, I talked a little bit about the Cerny method before. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the Cerny method was and, and what does it mean today? Um, so I don't, I don't call it the Cerny method. I just call it method. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can call it. The rest of us you call, can call it the it Cerny, Cerny method. method. Um, so in, in 1994, I had an amazing opportunity. And I, I think, I don't know, uh, maybe less than 100 people in the games industry have ever had this. I, I moved to Hollywood to work at Universal Studios in the middle of the, the multimedia boom. Whatever that was, I don't know. But they wanted to make multimedia. And they handed me a giant bag of, of money. And I had no supervision whatsoever. And, and he hated it, can you tell? Uh, tough times. <laughs> and you know, I thought, OK, so now um, nobody's watching. Nobody's telling me what to do. How is it that I feel games should be made? Um, and uh, two, three years later, when I'd made games in that fashion, and they'd done rather well, that was Crash Bandicoot and Spire of the Dragon, I put it up, made a list with Michael John. Yep. Um, the co-creator of Method, and uh, give a talk about it at DICE in 2002. So really, a couple points in that. One was, we had drifted far from our arcade roots. So it was pretty easy in 1972 to tell if your game was a good game or not. If your game was a good game, you'd earn lots of quarters. If your game was a bad game, you wouldn't get any. And so, uh, what was Nolan Bushnell's first take on games? Oh, good question. Computer space. Yep, computer it was space. easy to tell that computer yep. space was not as good a game as Pong because computer space um, didn't get very many quarters and Pong got so many that the first prototype busted as a result, right? <laughs> so this was a, a simple market because there was no marketing. There was no real sales. You would put your game in the arcade and the consumer would speak directly to you by spending money or not spending money. It's pretty brutal because they could, uh, they could see it for free, they could play it for a quarter, and if it wasn't fun, they wouldn't ever play it again. Very, very pure market. I think there's never been another aspect of gaming that's quite been like that. I mean, even, yeah, I mean, even iPhone, where the games are as cheap as they were in the arcades, the fact is there's 100,000 of them and they do do marketing for them. Yeah. The issue with consumer games with, by the mid-90s is we no longer saw who was playing our games. So we would hand it off to the marketing and sales department who would do the TV ads and make the box and sell that game for 50 bucks. And by the time it was in somebody's hands, it really didn't matter much. The quality of the game, that person owned it. I mean, that was the, right. the thinking. I mean, there were some real abuses of this, such as um, a friend of mine worked on a $50 game that only half of it could be finished. There was a fatal bug in the middle and they didn't bother finishing it because they didn't figure there would be much in the way of implications for that. <laughs> on our side in product development, um, there's this thing where, you know, you're a bunch of guys in the office making games. Who do you make the games for? You make them for each other. Uh, it had gotten to the point where the games were too hard even for us. <laughs> so one aspect of what we did was we did consumer testing. I know this doesn't sound very advanced, but wow, you try having that conversation in 1995. Mm -hmm. We had something called a focus test. So a focus test would be set up by the marketing department. They'd show you the game. They'd give you the game name. They'd have people play it for 90 minutes. If they'd, you're lucky, they had played it for 90 minutes. If you're unlucky, 10 minutes. Yeah. They'd have a moderated discussion. Uh, we put all that aside, and we just sat people down and we had them play for uh, from the start of the game to the end of the game and we'd watch and we'd see where they had problems with the game. Uh, and oh, is that an ego destroying experience? I mean, we do that. <laughs> you work on it for a year, you put it in front of people and then like as not, you are out doing some pretty heavy drinking that evening. <laughs> uh, so 
that was a phenomenal success. The first Crash Bandicoot was actually not done that way, and um, we were lucky enough, our producer in Japan, uh, a Mr. Shuhei Yoshi Yoshida, who now runs all of product development for Sony PlayStation. And a very nice man. Um, he ran it by his monitor group in Japan who reported some amazing things, as in, our game isn't playable. So from the next project, we set up this room, we did the testing. Um, if you go to a publisher today, like as not, you will find an exact duplicate of that room. Yep. And only about half of the companies know that that started in Foster City with uh, what was it? It was Crash Bandicoot 2 in 1997. And it's all the way down to people sit, you gotta sit people down, but they will watch each other play the games. And so you have to put up little barriers between them. You will see those little barriers in at pretty much every publisher in the world. I mean, it's a different world in that we were recording this stuff on videotape so we could look at it later and today it's digital. Yeah, I, I mean, the other thing you did was that I remember at the time was you had your grid paper maps. So he would have a map of what a game level would look like and when there are lots of little X's in one spot, that was not a happy mark. A lot, a lot of people dying, and if you needed to make it easier because the players weren't uh, getting past that, you would. But player confusion is much more of an issue than player death. And something like Jack and Daxter, if you didn't know what you were supposed to do next, you could wander around the virtual world for two hours, literally in one of these tests. And at some point, we'd figure that, hey, maybe we should put more hints in the game, and then we'd politely tap you on the shoulder and suggest and, and point you to where you really should go. So that was one of the aspects of method, was getting back in touch with the consumer. Um, another aspect of method was getting away from thinking of a game as something that you could write as a document. So I don't, and you know, EA was probably the worst offender. Sorry. EA, we, they had this thing called a GDD, right? A game design document, probably still do. And everybody wanted to copy EA's production, production methodologies because you know, EA was doing so well, um, sales-wise. Because we, we could spend more money than anybody else doing it. Probably. So the idea was that you would put a guy in a room and they would write about a 500-page document describing what the game would be if they were going to make the game, down to Every last detail, what the enemies look like, how many times you could hit them before they fell down. Then the idea would be that this document would be handed off to the producers and the programmers and they would make a schedule down to days as to how that game would get developed. Anything more involved here? Uh, yeah, and we would, we would believe that we could assess what every technical risk was going to be in advance oh, and right. mitigate them. Right. <laughs> which, which worked perfectly. We never had a bug the entire time. <laughs> Well, and what you, what you find out when you make a game is that you get about a week in and that wasn't fun and you do something totally different. Yeah, and it was, so, only the, it was only the second word in the first paragraph of the first thing. So it turns out it isn't fun to make a game about whales. So another aspect of method was that a game design was five pages and one picture to show what it is that you wanted to make. And you needed to green light the game or not on that basis. And as far as that schedule went, you were winging it anyway, right? <laughs> Stop lying to yourself. Then. So, I mean, in modern terms, you probably would want to work up 50 pages, but in modern terms, we have 100 people on these projects. It's not much of a, a sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, another aspect of this, and I guess the final big aspect of method was pre-production. So, my, my belief is we, we go and we start making these games, and it's a struggle. Some of them are fun fast, and some of them aren't fun for and, and you work at it and sometimes they get more fun and sometimes they don't. And there is this kind of toxic environment in some companies where as you're struggling to make your game fun that somehow you failed, right? And you should get rid of those guys and get more talented people to make your games. Well, the third and final part of Method was that really it's okay to kill the games. You know, not every game deserves to get made. Uh, and a different way of looking at this is if your company is operating properly, you will be killing something like, just to throw out a random number, about 30% of the games should die early in development. 
And by doing that, you're saving a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of heartache. And if, if you have the reverse philosophy that you've got to do all of them to the end, well, they won't turn out very well and I, probably people won't enjoy making them. Yeah, I mean, the dirty little secret is that you don't usually do anybody any favor by helping them finish a game that fails. It just is a waste of their time. It's a waste of the opportunity cost. So in modern terms, what would you do? You'd be making a $30 million title, which believe it or not, is on the cheap end for what we do these days. And yep. you'd spend about $10 million, and you'd get everybody in a room, and you'd say, OK, do we want to spend the next 20 or not? Uh, and you know, my feeling is 30%, even half, kill them at that point. Now, from an accounting perspective, you just threw out $10 million, right? right. So it's a very hard philosophy to get people to um, but you saved 20. Except, but you saved 20, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's, the challenge there is that that feels very scary to people who are in charge of money. Um, just, just for some context, we've made some progress. So what was that ratio like in coin-op? It wasn't 30%, it was... Oh, coin-op. Well, ratio. Atari was different than most coin-op. Yeah, so the answer there was like 80 or 90, right? It's two-thirds. Yeah, so 60% of all games that but were But that wasn't, no, that worked very differently, though. But that was the games that were taken to test. That was games that were 80% finished. So yeah. uh, Atari, uh, and uh, this is not the Pong era. This is like uh, early 1980s. Gauntlet era. Yeah, Gauntlet era. Um, it was a pretty interesting place. Uh, yeah. we, we were told as, as game creators that uh, what we had to do had to be absolutely unique because that is what management believed would sell. So if anybody had ever made a two-person fighting game, that we were basically banned from making a two-person fighting game because that would be insufficiently creative. Each game had to be a unique genre that nobody ever had seen before. Uh, fun. You did, you did well in that. I, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One failure, one did okay, that was Major, Ma Major Havoc, and then yep. one that did well, that was Marble Madness. Uh, now, we, we'd go ahead and we'd have these ideas, so it would be a brand new concept that any, nobody had seen before, brand new hardware every time. Uh, we would also have, uh, ideally, a brand new controller. We'd make these games up until about the 80% point, so when they looked like they were actually finished, but maybe the final parts of the game weren't there, we put it in an arcade, see if it earned enough money to sell, and at that point we would kill two out of three. And that's brutal. That's about eight months of your life. So what was funny was Electronic Arts used to be in just outside of Foster City, and across the street at the Fashion Island Mall was an arcade that was right next to the movie theater there. Yes. And our friends at Atari would always trot their new machines in there, so we'd run over at lunch and watch them. It was great. It was awesome. And we'd usually see somebody like Mark sitting in the back with a big frown on their face the entire time. Well, the, the economics were very difficult. So those machines were roughly $2,500, and they were being paid for by the quarter. The, the, the manufacturer didn't own those machines. That was the operator, like the, the yep. mall yep. owner. So that's 10,000 plays just to break even, except that that operator had uh, rent, salaries, electricity, a lot of repair, like $25 a month to keep those joysticks yeah. working. Uh, so it turned out you needed 20 or 30,000 plays on a machine to get it profitable. Uh, and it would be pretty easy to tell if you just put the machine, you put the machine in the mall, if that machine wasn't instantly the highest earning machine there, it was going to be unsaleable. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mark talked a little bit about the fact that he spent a little time in Hollywood. Uh, that was an interesting time for the whole of the business. I spent a little time trying to do business with Hollywood. My big, my big excitement was I settled the strike once. That's my high point. Um, but Mark actually spent more time there probably than anybody I can think of. A and a part of what made that interesting was the people he worked with and the time that he worked there. So he already talked a little bit about how Universal gave him a pile of money. But he didn't tell you is why. Um, he worked with some pretty interesting people at that time, including a guy named Skip Paul that I think was real important to you. Yeah, so um, when I joined Universal, it was 1994, uh, it was still uh, Lou Wasserman and Sid Sheinberg who had been running the company for, I think, 40 years. Uh, Music Corporation of America, right? They were agents to start all of that before it evolved into the modern Universal studio. Uh, and uh, I was recruited to... Um, work out uh, the strategy that Universal should take in the brand new world of multimedia. I think multimedia, what, it was missed. 
and seventh guest. guest. Yeah, exactly right. And then people thought that, okay, there's this thing and it's not a video game and we need to investigate. It's a brand new category of entertainment. Uh, and so one of the top couple or five executives at Universal, uh, a man named uh, Skip Paul, recruited me into to work on that. Uh, you know, I was at that point playing with Skip's slush fund, um, which was great because that was more than enough to fund video games. It was, uh, you know, make a game in those days. If you were spending $2 million, you were so radically outspending your competition. It was fantastic. Uh, and for Lou, that was just, uh, or for, uh, for Skip, that was just a script cost. Well, Skip used to warn me. He'd say, Mark, right now, you know, you guys aren't actually making any money, therefore you have complete free freedom. As soon as you start making money, then everybody's going to be interested in your part of the business. Um, so we managed to make, it was amazing, with about 10 staff. We decided to just make conventional video games with high budgets. We leveraged the heck out of the Universal Studios connection. So we had movie production designers. Um, I worked with Catherine Hardwick, who of course is now a quite famous movie director, but in those days she was my production designer on the game. Uh, they just opened it all up, animators, character designers, uh, musicians. And so we used all those connections and used the budgets which were high for the industry, and, but um, uh, small for Universal, put it all together and we must have made them $200 million in profit from just a couple years of work out of a group of 10 and initial seed money of less than $10 million. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and never to be repeated, I think. You can't, you can't <laughs> even make one game for that much money. So that, that's the era of, uh, of Crash and Spyro. Yes, that was, that was Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon, yeah. yes. So tell us about the teams that started those and some of those people and where they are now. So. Um, we had a small office on the lot, and uh, we had a marketing guy, and we had a product development guy, that was me, and we had a legal guy, that was my partner, had our, our uh, funding, and basically went out to the industry to see who would be, interest, who would be up for, um, well, uh, working with us. Uh, so, I mean, it's a fairly simple process. There are a number of independent developers and there's games that they want to make and there's games that we want to make. And so signing a developer is really a process of negotiating to see maybe you want the thing that they're making or you maybe you have a concept that you want to bring to them. So we ended up um, picking up four very, very small companies. Uh, Naughty Dog, which was three people. Uh, Insomniac, which was two people, and two more companies, which are actually slightly larger. I think they were maybe five and seven people, respectively. Massive. Uh, Massive. And we, we worked with those people. We hooked up the money pipe, and we hooked up. We had a couple of producers on the staff ourselves with a lot of experience, and we'd work with these young guys, and we, we grew the teams. The, the, the teams that succeeded were Insomniac and Naughty Dog, and in both cases, they had uh, management that was incredibly driven. I mean, Ted Price at Insomniac, that was a guy who, if he had to sleep under his desk for five years to make it happen, he was going to sleep under his desk. And I, I think you add it all up to this point, maybe... Maybe he has. Well, maybe he has, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, and then Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog, uh, Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin. Um, Actually, a third member, um, Dave Baggett, who went right. on to form an internet company and sell it for almost a billion dollars after he left games. Yeah, we didn't make that transition yeah. right, did we, Mark? Blew that one. These, these are, these, uh, but these companies today, there are maybe two, three hundred people, and uh, subsequent to graduating from Universal, uh, they've both made, I don't know, 15 or 20 games. I mean, in aggregate, each of those companies has probably made about a billion dollars of video games at this point. Right, yeah, and Naughty Dog, for the last couple of years, has really dominated the awards with its Uncharted series on the Sony. Yes. Mark had worked on those, too. Um, let's see, here's, I have a great question on here, which is, uh, you know, why did you leave Universal? What caused that to happen? Well, I concerned? left Universal because um, we were middlemen. Uh, we elected not to s do the marketing and sales for the titles that Insomniac and Naughty Dog created. We contracted with them to create the games, and then we contracted with Sony Computer Entertainment to do the marketing and sales. And we had three product deals with Naughty Dog and Insomniac. And 
after the three products were finished, in both cases, Sony convinced them to sign with them directly and cut out Universal Interactive Studios, which was the division by that point I was the president of. So I had kind of a tough choice. I could rebuild, which means go back and try to find developers who were two, three people and, and, and grow them. And you know, I figured that the, the most fun you ever get is working with talented people. And it doesn't really matter what your role is. And so I gave up being you know, president of a division at Universal at age 34. Um, to uh, just so I could go be a consultant with Insomniac and Naughty Dog because I figured that at the end of the day that would be a lot more fun. And was it? It was a lot more fun, though I, I do, do have to say once those games hit about a hundred people a project, it gets very hard to chip in from the side and add that little piece. So working on two or four games with a variety of companies, that's easier when the teams, um, smaller. yeah, maybe ten people. Uh, and it, at this point, there's really not a whole lot uh, I can even contribute. I mean, Insomniac and Naughty Dog are pretty much the top of the industry. Um, one of the people that I know has been, th there are a lot of great inspirations in, in the room here for us today, but I know that, uh, that Mark and I have kind of, it is difficult to describe the reverence that the game business has for, for Miyamoto. And uh, who, who in this room knows who Miyamoto is? That's actually, this is better than average, so I'm glad to see that. Um, uh, you know, we think we're pretty good at what we do from time to time, and then Miyamoto points out to us we have no idea. Tell me more about your experiences with Miyamoto. Oh, it's just difficult. So I like making character action games. What is Miyamoto's claim to fame? It's character action <laughs> games, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, you, know, you make a game and it gets published and the reporters will instantly compare it to whatever the latest game Miyamoto came out with and usually they'll tell you it's not as good. So uh, when I was working on Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, actually the, the lead designer for um, Inspiration, uh, he wrote, uh, he's a Japanese gentleman, and he wrote down a, a brief poem with beautiful calligraphy and if you read it carefully it said Miyamoto Shigeru Sorry, Shigeru Miyamoto is a fart. <laughs> but it was beautiful. And he, you know, he'd look at that each day, and he'd get angry, and he'd work hard. <laughs> uh, it, it's his, uh, the effect he's had on our business is pretty amazing. I mean, he's been in contact with his customers at a, at a level that really has been inspirational to, to everybody in our business. And at the same time, he's had a sense of whimsy that is really hard to match. Uh, he makes up stuff that is just unimaginable. I think it's the banjo playing that does it. Um, let's see here. So um, you worked on a lot of kind of famous products in the business. A couple of them were a surprise. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Sonic? That was the other great uh, Sonic the Hedgehog action product in the business besides Mario. So uh, it's, it's been 20 years. Yeah. I'm hoping there's a statute of limitations here. <laughs> so um, Sonic the Hedgehog came out when I was working for Sega, which is a Japanese company. And uh, Sega had been um, struggling. They've been trying to make not just the, uh, the games, but also the consoles that the games had been played on. They had a 4-bit system, which was sold only in Japan, which did. Um, Okay, then they had an 8-bit system, the uh, Sega Master System, and that had a 4% market share uh, in the United States. And Nintendo had 94, and Atari, which was continuing its downward decline, had the remaining two. I mean, 4% of consoles, that's just mom going into the store and buying the wrong console because <laughs> <laughs> they, all, they all look alike to her, right? <laughs> Maybe, maybe she didn't even know there was more than one. Uh, so Sega came up with their next console. This was the Genesis. It's a 16-bit console. And they had the idea that they put just an, uh, an unheralded amount of money into a game. They would have three people and work for 10 months on this thing. Shot. 30 man months. Well, Sega in, in Japan in particular was quite the sweatshop. I, mean, I, I worked there for a couple years. Is one programmer, one artist, three months, that's a game. Uh, and at, at the point at which I joined the Tokyo uh, group, they'd made 40 games of which two could be played and enjoyed. Yikes. Yeah. So anyway, this idea, uh, take a step back, put 
what is that? That's five times as much uh, investment into a single title. And that title was Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, and they were really interested in Disney characters and Disney very fluid animation. And one of the things they did uh, was they, they drew up a couple characters, uh, including the one that became Sonic. He was modified a little bit afterwards. His arms were short, shortened and his color was changed slightly. But they, they handed over three characters. Sonic, something that looked like Bart Simpson, uh, a couple more. And on one, one of my trips shuttling back and forth between the States and Japan, they handed it to me and said, you know, Mark, uh, you're an American. What do, you, what do you think? And I thought, wow, you know, that's just anecdotal. Um, it's not as if my opinion really matters here if I say it's great. You know, we need to ask the clever brains in marketing at <laughs> Sega of America what they think. Oh, no. So I take these and I make color copies of them from in the Tokyo office. Color copies being a rather hard thing to do in I Tokyo yeah. in 1988, 1989. And, uh, I take them back to the States and I present the copies and, you know, here's our number one team from Tokyo and the concept they're working on and we could really use your feedback. No response. Uh, three months later I ask and they say, well, you know, that, those characters, they're so bad they're unsalvageable. So no response back to the team, but the idea was that they were going to make a list of the 10 things you needed to do if you were going to create a character that would be successful in the States. Um, and then they wanted to work with, um, they were talking about quality characters like Will Vinton, like, um, sure. which are interesting things. Yep. Definitely Americana though. Yep. Um, and how, you know, that's what you want to do if it's going to be successful. Of course, Sonic came out, Sega's largest success ever, uh, to the point where it came out and then they dropped the price of the hardware a little bit and then within the space of six weeks their console was selling five times as much. That's how big the impact of that game was with its unsalvageable character. <laughs> Though, to be fair to them, you know, it's a video game. A character is good but what the character does that's much more important. If your character is six out of ten, if your gameplay is great, you'll still be there. Mario in the original Donkey Kong right. is okay. Uh, Crash Bandicoot, probably okay. What is that? Is that a... I was asked on my Tokyo interviews, right. is that a ghost? Is that a dog? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's no, a dog. it's Crash Bandicoot. Bandicoot. It's yeah. a hint. <laughs> Go look it up. It's a real animal. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like the animal is part of it. Uh, Another thing that happened there is this, this, uh, this team, this three people, 10 months, is it took them 14 months. And they had to add one full-time person and one part-time person to finish it. So by the time it was done, 4.5 people, 14 months, essentially twice the budget that they'd been allocated, uh, the project leader got cussed out by the company president and quit basically as soon as that game shipped. So that is the end of Sonic in Japan. Well, so what, what those who don't get, one of the things that I thought was so valuable about Sonic for Sega at the time was Sega was trying to make the case they had a higher performance gaming system. Blast processing. Than the yeah. Nintendo Entertainment System. And Sonic was all about speed. And so it meant that the personification character of that platform really tried to carry the marketing position for it. I'm, I'm sure it was not designed in, but it sure worked well. No, it was absolutely designed in. It was by design. It was attempting to show how fast the console right. could be. And it was a 60 frame per second game when that was unheard of. So, so after the uh, project lead quit in Tokyo, um, I, I was running a, a games group in, this, in the States for, yep. for Sega. And so uh, I figured out that if I rehired him domestically, then he didn't have to be paid. Believe it or not, in Tokyo, paid by seniority. Um, and the max that these guys were getting was about 30000 a year. This guy made a game that sold 8 million cartridges. What is that? That's a half a billion dollars worth yep. of cartridges. And he, he did get the president's bonus before he quit, which is another 30000 but just crazy low competition. Um, but in the States, we could get around all that. And so he came to the States, and Sonic 2, 3, and 4 were done um, uh, just across the street from here, in wow. fact. Embarcadero Road. So where is he now? Uh, who, we should tell people who we're talking about. Oh, way. Yuji Naka. <laughs> um, he's quit and started a small independent developer, and beyond that, I don't know. 
it's one of the things we see a lot is, is that the phone business has been a great comeback for the coin op guys because essentially the granularity of that platform, the way people play it, works a lot like coin op. And so a lot of coin op names are coming back out of the woodwork. And then it's good for us. Um, let's see here. Let's talk about Atari. So when did you go to work for Atari? How old were you? I was 17. Yeah. So, and, and what did you do before you were at Atari? So I um, started, I went, got to high school when I was 12. I started auditing classes at UC Berkeley when I was 13. Uh, I graduated from high school at 15. Uh, I, when, by the time I got to UC Berkeley, I'd done, I was into the third year math and physics. But I have to say, I don't know. Uh, it just wasn't all that interesting at the end of the day. It was just a bit of a tragedy. I was a good student, right. but uh, I just wasn't finding all that much joy in it. And at the same time, I had two hobbies, which were programming and playing video games. And I got a chance to uh, combine both into a job and jump for it. So I started at Atari uh, January 18, 1982. Wow. Which is uh, almost exactly 30 years. Oh, almost yeah, we're, years we're over. Yeah, we're over 30 years now. So when you first went there, who was there, and what was it like? Well, uh, Nolan Bushnell was gone by then. Um, he'd left a few years before, but uh, Ed Logg and Dave Toyer, um, a couple other of the game greats were there. I just missed Ed Rotberg, who'd left the right. year before. But these were the guys who made. If any of you were in an arcade 30 years ago, they made Asteroids, Centipede. Um, Battle Zone, Missile Command, Tempest, and the, the truly great masterworks of yeah. that era. Yeah. yeah. That, and that was it. So your Time Warner had just kind of bought those guys, so they, they had kind of fat paychecks, although. They did not have fat paychecks. Oh, well, that's a shame then. Yeah, it, it was a shame. Uh, it was bought, I swear the company was bought in 1977, and that money didn't go to the creators. So what happened there was that the Atari VCS, the consumer uh, console, um, also part of Atari, right. um, was doing amazingly well. And independent developers were being started up. You, you, know, you could just go and set up your own shop to make these games. And so Atari thought that they needed to pay their programmers a lot more money uh, to, to retain them. And so you could get, simply based on the manufactured numbers of cartridges, a bonus of yeah, oh, wow. 15 cents. That was the bonus to retain people, which meant that um, Pac-Man, the company, the game that almost put the company down, seven million cartridges, 15 cents. The day that shipped, they wrote out a check to Todd Fry yep, for, uh, for 1.05 million dollars. Put that in today's dollars, it's about 2.5 million. And then Todd failed to file an income tax return. <laughs> it's one of the Great stories of the era. It is, and, and Todd built that. That was only about eight weeks, 12 weeks work, something like I that? I think, yeah, I thought it was about three months. Yeah and, yeah, and he knew what the right answer was, by the way, which often we don't know what the right answer was. So anyway, um, in CoinOp, which was a totally separate division of Atari, they saw that, and there was this brief period between when sales were still high and before the market crashed, right. when they bumped up the bonuses where you could get, um, oh, it was something like $20 for every game that was sold. It was really good money. Right, yeah. Well, you guys, so I worked in the other side of the fence. We paid a lot of attention because Atari had an interesting compensation system. So there were bonuses on those particular games, but how were those bonuses allocated? Oh, over a number of years. So uh, I quit. But what I remember was the team share. Stuff. Oh, right. It was a team sharing thing. So you'd split it, up, split it up between the hardware engineers and the software engineers, and there'd be some project management that, that could get some money. So if you had a huge role on the project, you'd end up with something like 25% right. of it. But 25% of, um, of, that $20, of that $20 per year. is, that is $5. And uh, those games were, you know, in the heyday, that was 50,000 units. That was real money. But there was only, as I said, one year. And the only game which came out in that one year was Millipede that sold anything. Uh, but that, that sold 10 million units. Yeah. Sorry, 10,000 units. That was good for Ed. That was Ed's game, right? Yeah, that was Ed's game, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so what caused you to leave Atari? Oh, I don't know. I made a game and it had sold well and nothing had changed. And, you know, if I'd been older than, say, 20, um, <laughs> I think that wouldn't have bothered me. But I was 20 and I was expecting things to happen so fast in my life. Well, Marble Madness is really, in, in a world of quite different games at Atari, Marble Madness is quite different. Yeah, it was a. 
I'm, I'm very glad I did it. It was a nice thing to have done in my youth. <laughs> Uh, so, and also I, I started thinking, wow, this is easy, right? Here it is, I was doing project management on this thing and I did design and I did pro pro programming and it's going to be a huge success. Why don't I set up my own company and do this? And then... Uh, and then you did. And then I did. And I set up Shoestring Video and that did not go so well. <laughs> uh, I went broke and I joined Sega. There you go. Um, so you went, you, uh, you had the benefit of pretty accelerated education. What was the training from all of that that you ended up finding was the most useful? Well, ironically, uh, out of all the training I've ever gotten, the most use has been from going to Heald Business College <laughs> and learning how to touch type on a manual typewriter. Uh, so that really helps with uh, making the, the programs and the memos and the like. I did that one summer when I was 12 when my mother wanted me out of the house. <laughs> that was your version of summer school? Yeah, that's my version of summer school. That's been a tremendous help. But, um, also, of course, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, not much call for that in the video games, but, you know, physics, uh, it, it does have its uses, and definitely having a solid mathematical background is very useful in games. Well, I, I, so I'll, I'll give him one little hint here of what I think is important. One of the things that Mark made the transition from that very few people made, the 80s was about video games that in general were 2D video games. They were sprite-based objects on, on play fields that went off into the background. And about 1995 or so, that started to change. And so our business is predominantly now 3D oriented. The things that you see in movies and the things that we build are often the same kinds of things. The vast majority of programmers in our business did not survive that transition. And Mark was one of those who did. I suspect Berkeley, among other places, had something to do with it. Well, that. actually, I got in a very early start on all of that. Is um, I loved the video games. And um, I was doing a little hobbyist programming in high school. and. Uh, I was also playing Dungeons and Dragons with my brother and his friends. Not AD&D, the original. I mean, we're talking 1976 here. And uh, I was thinking, wow, all this rolling of dice and maps, and wouldn't this be easier with computers? So uh, I sat down with my brother, and we had this idea that we would borrow a little equipment from the university. <laughs> and create a real-time 3D dungeon-crawling, story-driven, 20-hour RPG with you know, combat sequences rendered from above with, for speed and then for um, when you're walking around the dungeon, we'd have to do it on a scope. I mean, this is ancient days, right. but we could do that hidden line if we wrote our programs right and give solidity to the objects, even though they were just done with green lines. Uh, and we were trying to do this with punch cards. Um, On a? Well, originally a CDC 6400. Yes. Big uh, iron. And it was a little ambitious. I mean, on the plus side, I derived, I didn't read it in a book, I derived the mathematics for 3D projections and how you could have a simulated world and get that on the screen properly uh, using Trig when I was 12. Uh, the, uh, tw tw twelve, twelve, twelve. <laughs> the, uh, we did, my brother and I, uh, we gave up after a while, but, um, we did finally see the game that we were trying to make. It released 20, oh, how many years? 17 years later. It was, uh, called Final Fantasy VII. Oh, there you go. <laughs> And all it needed was a highly trained team of 30 professionals in about five years. 30? It was only 30? Well, maybe more. Maybe I don't know. Maybe more, I think, on that one. Well, that, that's a nice segue. This is one of my favorite stories of the evening, which is what was your first computer? You well, the first it? one was a PDP-11 on punch tape. But then, yeah, the first computer I really spent any time on was the CDC-6400. Uh, this is our hardware geek out phone. So that happens to be my first computer, too. Yeah. I don't think there were more than 100 ever made. So it's just kind of ironic that we well, all started out in the same Core thing. memory, right? Yeah. What's not to like? I mean, this was an era when you could actually see the bits. You had little <laughs> magnetic cores, and you'd run four wires with them, and you'd, you'd build up arrays that were about the size of the door. And the guys had to do memory maintenance once a week, where they'd literally go through one million of these cores. It was 128K of core memory we had. And find the bad ones and replace them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, what I remember was the machine had a boot ROM, and the boot ROM was a 64 by 60 uh, panel of toggle switches. So you just set the bits, and well, that's how you boot it. it is ROM. It was ROM. 
So I, for me, it was literally the first machine I used when I was 12, and my first real computer job in the industry working for the Nevada test site was operating a CDC 6400. So it just followed me wherever I went, at least in my case. I do have to say, when we started getting the Linux boxes in it, sorry, Unix boxes in at Berkeley, it just seemed so wrong. <laughs> here's, here's a machine, you'd go bike and there'd be an empty room and there'd be like 10 of them with nobody at them and it's this valuable computer resource being wasted. wasted. That's yeah. right. Mostly the floor space, yeah. nothing else. No, they, it was quite an era. One of, the, one of the things I put down in here besides what's your first computer was what's your first computer disappointment? What's the first computer that broke your heart? Do I have one? I don't know. I think you do. Oh. You've had some hardware you loved that didn't love us back. 3DO didn't love 3DO. us back. <laughs> 3DO, we tried. We really we did. We tried. Uh, you didn't, I wasn't, uh, I, I loved the Amiga and it tried to love me back, but it could only do so much. Um, so we talked a little bit about what you've been doing lately. Mm, we'll come back to that one, I think. Um, how do you think, you know, how do you think you've helped change the console business? Um, I think, uh, yeah, realistically, I, I was one of a bunch of guys in the mid-90s that were trying to get, get us back on course when we'd strayed too far. And we'd forgotten who was actually buying our games and we'd forgotten how to make a game. Yep. Uh, as far as the design side goes, you know, they've been really fun games, but it's Jerry Bruckheimer stuff. And it's just what I like to make. And, you know, it's not going to change the world. Uh, but people play it but a people lot. People play it and people enjoy it. You know, and that's, that's enough that's for, kind of for me doing. anyway. Uh, let's see here. So one of the things that both of us have, have been lucky to do is to be kind of grand generalists in a business. And, and one of the things we've seen is teams go from three people who had to do everything under the sun, or one person maybe from time to time, yes I remember that era too, to teams that have 300 yeah. or more people on them. And one of the things that come out of that is specialization. That's been good news, but how's that been bad news? Well, first, the good news, right? So if you started out making games in 1982 or 1985, um, you were the programmer, the artist, the game designer, you did your own sounds, and you wrote your own music. And if you start out that way, you know, your later life, you're not going to end up in any one pigeonhole. That's it's right. great. And, and you know, you've, been, you've been the producer, too, right? Yep. And, uh, sure. and I'm a writer these days. I mean, once you, once you get going on that, yeah, you can't, you can't stop. You end up writing music for things you shouldn't write music for. What I, what I fear is, that the trend though, is you'll, you'll think in advance about what you're going to do. Maybe you'll think, wow, um, I've got a mind for physics and I'd like to make games. So you study physics in school and then you join a games company and you're the physics programmer, which is not all that exciting 20 years in, except that then you'll be the guy that takes the physics middleware, right? Some software package and you're just integrating it and then maybe you aren't even doing that anymore because it's part of the SDK that comes from the publisher. Or built in the hardware maybe someday. Or I think less likely. Less likely. Less likely. Yeah, less likely. So you know, my advice for anybody who's going to school, um, do a lot of things and uh, if you're in your first years at a company is uh, maybe it'll cause trouble when you do this, but really try to do a lot of different things. Uh, even, uh, even if it ruffles some feathers, uh, the, the, you'll have a lot more fun 10 or 20 years in if you had that kind of variety in your early years. Yeah, I mean, game, making games is lots of things at the same time. Um, one of the things that you and I have seen happen that's kind of funny to us, the, the idea 20 years ago or 25 years ago that somebody would think that a video game could, could say something or do some world changing thing would have been pretty laughable to us at that point in time. That's been one of the changes we've seen is people try and use games for other things. <laughs> What's amused you about that and what has horrified you? <laughs> uh, well, I'm fascinated by it. So, I mean, we now have, they're called serious games, right? I don't know if that's the best name for them, but uh, <laughs> firefighter simulations or uh, simulations of a Navy vessel, aircraft carrier simulations. You have people making simulations of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where you can go in and if you have a bright idea, you can yep. move things around and see if it actually might result in something, some different uh, environment. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is, yes. is, has an excellent program. Uh, for that yep. right now. Yeah, CMU ETC, the program at Carnegie Mellon that occasionally is here, some of you know. Uh, 
those of you who don't know, the ETC program develops both video game folks as well as folks for the museum business. And so for us, they look at it as one continuum, and that's one good example of that. Um, let's see here. I have one more in here that we. Can I come back to this one now? Why are games so fascinating, Mark? I don't know. I mean, we've, it's not just video games, right? We've had games perhaps for as long as we've had music and speech and everything else. Um, I, know, I mean, I, I look at, it's not quite the answer to your question, but I mean, my belief is pretty much everybody likes games. And historically, we've had a problem with the arcade games, and we've had a problem with these console games. This is just so hard, is you might enjoy games, but you have to read a 90-page manual before you can start playing your game. Who wants to do that? So we've taken a world where 7 to 8 billion people would pretty much all enjoy that sort of thing and made it almost impossible for them to get started with it. And we're, we're seeing evidence of this in that these, these iPhone games and these Android games, I mean, the market's exploded. We have 10 times more people playing games now that uh, it's obvious, right? You just buy it, boot it, play it, and no, you know, nobody has to tell you the rules. Yep, that's usually the answer. Often played in the bathroom, by the way, nowadays, apparently. <laughs> so w one of the things that, one of the other things I've watched Mark over time do is be fascinated with Japanese culture and, and really get um, immersed in that over time. Some of it is spending the time that he did living there. Um, but you know, what do you enjoy best about Japan? What, what is it that, how it influenced your life? Oh, I love Tokyo. I mean, it's a huge city. There's always something going on. I don't think it's a, pretty, a particularly sophisticated attraction to the place, but uh, wow, that's a lot of people in not too much square area. Right, a lot of motion. Yeah. A lot of motion. Try going to uh, Shibuya Scramble Crossing sometime if you want to see a mass of humanity. <laughs> well, one, one of the things, so I'm kind of the sports guy of the two of us. Mark's not famous for being in the sports business. I don't think you've ever actually had to make a sports product I'm aware of. No. So, Cal Games. California Games. Alternative sports. <laughs> but one of the things that I, I watched Mark get very interested in the 90s in was sumo. And I just was fascinated by the entire process. What got you into sumo? I don't know. What is sumo? I mean, <laughs> is it theater? Is it sport? Um, is it art? Those guys, uh, they'll put on these embroidered, uh, what are the heck would you call them, skirts? Yeah. Uh, for Holy. events uh, that some poor person had to spend a year making. It's very artistic. Uh, it's a little religious. Um, it's a little corrupt. I mean, you've got, had this major scandal last year where they were betting on baseball matches. So they were, which of course arranged through right. the local Yakuza. And then um, they were trading off favors. It also turned out where they would, hey, I'll let you win this time if you let me win last time. And they got busted because they were just sending casual text messages on their cell phones. So it's just this big mass of stuff all put together. And uh, it's almost the perfect personification of everything about Japan in one little thing. Right? Yeah, it's great. I'm going to answer, ask some of your questions here. Um, so here's, a, here's an excellent one. Which kids did you play as? A, which games did you play as a kid in the pre-electronic age um, that may lead to your cre creativity in the computer age? Uh, played what everybody else played, which is Monopoly and Life and Risk and the like. I'd love to make a strategy game someday. Risk was pretty cool back in the day. Has anybody played Risk recently? Because it isn't as good as it used to be. Well, we, I'm like you. I, like, I played Risk a lot, and it actually my first electronics project with a 4004 processor was a counter simply to make it so I didn't have to roll dice for risk. So, there you have it. Yeah, so there you go. I, I, the irony was I was working on risk today, so it never goes away, I guess. Um, and they weren't board games, but um, Dungeons and Dragons and a couple others like uh, Empire of the Petal Throne and... Uh, Those count. They're, they're table yeah. games, yeah. Um, what's your current favorite game? I used to subscribe to Strategy and Tactics magazine as yes, well you did. back oh. in the day. That's more hardcore than me. The military yeah. stuff is too hardcore. That's okay. I didn't understand it. <laughs> What's your favorite current game? Oh, my favorite current game is finishing my game. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as soon as I have some time, I really want to play Journey. Uh, oh, okay. Should be nice. Uh, <laughs> 
for curiosity's sake, how many coding all-nighters have you pulled? The actual question is how many coding double all-nighters have you pulled? <laughs> and the number is three. Oh my, what era? Uh, crystal Dynamics. Oh, all at Crystal. So in the 90s, yeah. Um, and only one emergency room visit. <laughs> for you or for somebody oh, else? Oh, for me. <laughs> it turns out strange things happen to your body if you sit upright for 50 hours in a row on a regular basis. <laughs> I don't know if I, I want to know. I can't really recommend yeah, it. Yeah, I don't even want to know. Here's a nice long question, but it's actually a good one. Uh, I am currently working at a programmer at a systems company. If I join a game company, will I participate in things other than software development? I mean, how easy is the transition to a job where, where I mix the kind of visual kind of design with the software design? It really all depends on the company. So uh, some of the companies are unbelievably collaborative. Um, Naughty Dog. Uh, I mean, at least on the last project I was with them, which was Uncharted 1, um, just had the attitude that it's everybody's game, and if you see something that needs to get fixed, go fix it, or if it's somebody else's job, go talk to them about it. And this, this is, believe it or not, was literally true. If as a programmer, don't get carried away, mind you, but if you think the art in some level of the game is not up to snuff, you're encouraged to go have that conversation. And they're doing well. You'd think that would lead to warfare, right? Trench warfare in the cubicles. Uh, but they did very well with it. So, Company like that, you'll do very well. Um, many companies are not like that. Uh, the larger the project is, the tougher it is because on, on some level there has to be structure. Yeah, usually what's true is the larger the company is, the more money is at play, the less yeah. tolerance. I mean, I, I would say really the thing to do is uh, find somebody who's doing a two, three person um, phone or tablet game and join that because when the project's just two, three people, it's bound to be collaborative on that level. Um. I know who wrote that question, but we won't answer that one for this crowd. All right, let's see here. So, um, ignoring the costs involved, what are your thoughts about cloud gaming? Um, can you talk specifically about what Sony will incorporate with Gaikai? Um, I think it's very interesting, and I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask uh, me mean, to answer the, it. The idea that we don't need uh, hardware in front of us, that we can just have it somewhere out in the cloud, and when we, when we uh, need to use that resource, we can tap into it. That's very evolved, right? That's getting past that petty idea that you need to own things yourself. Uh, at the same time, the amount of infrastructure you have to set up, uh, you know, we're going to see just how far that can be pushed. I know that's going to be tremendous for demos. In fact, it works really well for demos today, right? right. You want to try out a title. Um, that might take two hours to install, and with that kind of technology, you can be up and running in two minutes on it. Or a second. Yeah, yeah really fast. Um, what are the game that you found most inspiring from the 80s uh, and 90s and now? Uh, so, 80s, that was a while ago. Defender. Defender. Defender, of course, Defender. Defender. Thank you, Eugene Jarvis. Absolutely. Defender, one of my personal heroes made yeah. that. Uh, arcade game. Uh, one of the hardest arcade games ever created. Uh, from the 90s, um, have you ever cried playing a game? Yes, many I, times. I, Usually with something with frustration, ship, yeah. yeah. Ship that next day. So, oh, you know, you know these Japanese RPGs. You have like your hundred-hour quest. <laughs> it was so sad. Is is um, you know she's kept him waiting for ten thousand years, kind of thing. And just when they get reunited, he dies. It's it was Legend of Dragoon, which oh, came out of. Um, but play it in Japanese. Don't play it in it's English. Awful. Yeah, play it in Japanese. I'll do that. Sure. Uh, um, do you see the games industry turning to quality games instead of marketing poor games? I think the industry makes quality games right now. I think um, in, if you like big games, uh, you're doing really well as a console player. And if you like smaller games, you're doing really well with tablet games and phone games. Yeah, there is, I, I do not know of a time when there have been more places to play games and more good games available on all different kinds of formats. How do you pick which games to design? Survey, poll? The difficulty is you can't really ask people what they want. Um, if you do that, well, we've both tried yeah. that, right? We, so we, paid we a price both for that. did this thing in the 90s where we would, um, because marketing made us, we <laughs> would write down little descriptions of the game we wanted to make and we'd show it to 10 
consumers who would be like living in San Francisco or something. It's not really right. America there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that came out totally no, wrong. They, lived, they lived in San they Mateo, they were a, nearby. That's right, or San Mateo, or they live in a large city, city yeah. right? And uh, they're probably all working in high tech anyway. anyway yeah. And so you run your little concept by them and you ask them, you know, would you buy this game? But the thing is you haven't made the game. It's as silly as it's trying to <laughs> give three sentences about a movie and ask if you should spend $150 million making that movie. I think you're the one that told me that very famously when Will Wright was thinking about making SimCity, uh, there were five concepts that were tested and the concept that tested worst was SimCity, Sim which he ended up doing because he wanted to. He blew off the results will, of that yeah, testing yeah. and it is his number one success. Yep. Even for Will. Yep, even for Will. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So I have, we're, we're gonna, we cannot escape a conversation about games without a conversation about copy protection. So you and I will have this because we have to. What are the thoughts on DRM, which is digital rights management? Uh, you know, I personally try not to think about it very much. Um, music business seems to be doing okay, um, but they've had a real restructuring. So they're a lot more focused on, um, uh, what they can do with the artist uh, and the concerts and all that, the events where participation is, is involved and actually selling that object or even selling the rights has diminished due right. to, um, well, very high rates of, policy, of, of piracy. Um, PlayStation 3, which is the bulk of what I've been doing these past few years, apart from one very bad month, uh, has been going pretty well. We are free to make a title and then that title is sold to people who purchase it and we don't need to think about it. Yep. Uh, the one thing I'll add to that is most of what we have seen is that DRM is increasingly not necessary. And the reason why is because the games want to know who you are because you have some relationship with other people. Right. And so a lot of the companies are now trying to foster long-term relationships with the people who play their games. You're doing that with FIFA, yep. right? You have tournaments yep. and things. Yep. And so if you want to be included in that set, you will need to have bought the product and joined the club. And maybe you could pirate it, but then you'd be losing out on that living world. That's right. Um, we, we always have to have the great question, what do I do in life here? So what advice would you offer to a soon-to-be college grads looking to join this industry? Uh, I think I offered that, which is make sure you don't get pigeonholed. But um, these days, uh, I have to say, if it's the console business, it's tough to get hired, so maybe just take that job. <laughs> um, let's see here. I've got, I got one last one. Because um, this is the right, next, the right last one here. So uh, where does Mark go from here? What's Mark's next job look like? Oh, that's going to be quick because I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to thank Carol and everybody else from the Computer History Museum for having us tonight. Um, I appreciate all your time. Thanks for your great questions. And hopefully we see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>